Father, we give you praise. Lord, we give you glory. Lord, we honor you. We're so thankful for every session, every word, every revelation, the truth that has come forth. We're thankful. Lord, even as the truth has been ministered, we're thankful, Lord, that we're being delivered. We're thankful, Lord, that we're being healed, we're being made whole. We're thankful, Lord, that in the preaching, Father, there is word, Father God, that is prophesying into our lives, into our destiny, into our future. We are thankful for such a time as this. We worship you, King of Kings. We worship you, Lord of Lords. We worship you, Almighty Great I Am. We're thankful, Spirit of the Living God, that you're with us. Even as we come into this session, that is supposed to be the third and the last of this particular meeting, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would replenish your Son, strengthen, fresh anointing. We ask for the glory of the Lord to be made manifest in this atmosphere. Lord, show us your glory, show us your goodness. Speak to our hearts. Do what only you can do. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Once again, I have the privilege of inviting the Son of God. You know, the, the most incredible title we could have on this earth is to be a son. I believe an apostle. Because many people don't understand. They think apostles are just people who start churches. Of course, he started churches. And I'm sure you know that currently he's um, pastoring my church, Windsor. But that's not the first ministry. He's, he's started many other ministries um, over the years. But one of the key things, key hallmarks of an apostle is that an apostle changes culture. Because, you know, people just say, okay, yes, it's a sent one. Yes, apostolos, a sent one. But sent to do what? How many people know? Do you know that the word apostle was not coined up by the church? It was used even by the Romans. An apostolic company was one who was sent together with helpers. And they go into a region and they colonize the region for Rome. They turn the place into a colony for Rome. In other words, they take the culture of Rome, take it into the place, and totally recolonize the place. So one of the hallmarks of a true apostle is that God uses them to change culture. Through the agency of media, you can already see what's going on with Rig Nation. I just found out that the YouTube channel has over 100,000 subscribers. How many people know when you have access to people's ears, you are changing culture? And truth changes culture. People are transformed when their minds are renewed. And mind is renewed with new truth. I'm just so excited that we've finally been able to have this sessions. And honestly, I wish there was something I could do to just make him stay and do the three sessions we have tomorrow. Let me just sit down there. You know, it's good sometimes to feed. And one thing you've got to understand about us ministers is that sometimes we struggle to find um, good food. It's not pride. It's not that we, we can learn from everybody. I can learn from my children. I can learn from any of you. I mean, God's hand is upon all of you. You can all tap into fine revelation. But when... A preacher finds good food. You just want to sit down and eat. So I get excited sometimes. I jump up. And then other times I'm like, okay, settle down, Daniel. And the times when I'm sitting down, I don't want anybody distracting me because it's like, I just want to eat. I've been fed tremendously in the last two sessions and I'm ready to sit down and eat again. I'm going to ask you to do something. This is a physical act but with a prophetic mean. Just shake down, shake down all the stuff that you, shake it down, shake it down, shake it down. Make room. Make room for more. Make room, make room, make room, make room. Are you ready? Can you, can you take some more? Can you handle some more? Are you sure you can handle some more? Alright, why don't you join me in welcoming God's apostle Tommy Arayomi, as it comes to minister to us. All right. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you. We bless you for activating us, for stirring us up. We thank you for your word. Your word, O oh God, is truth. We thank you for this house. Lord, that in the spirit, it is a juggernaut of change for this culture. Lord, we thank you and we pull all of those things into the now, right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated, but before you do, just hug somebody and uh, tell them your future is so bright. You need sunglasses to look at it. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to just uh, speak quickly into the final session. But before we do, I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Somebody, uh, uh, your apostle asked me, how does the channel that you have grow? And it really grows because, number one, I believe God is speaking into a void uh, in the nations with the prophetic being at such a place of being so rare. Um, I think when you feel something that's rare, people gather towards it. Another reason is because people actually share it. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to go on YouTube and search for the church's YouTube channel, which is Kingdom Kingdom Faith Church on YouTube. Search Kingdom Faith Church and just hit the share button. Do it right now. I'm not going to preach until everybody does it. I refuse. I refuse. That's not manipulation. That's just kingdom. So everybody get on your phone right now. I need to see. Wave your phone in the air like you just don't care so I can see who doesn't have their phone. Okay, wave your phone. This side still hasn't caught up yet. If you have your phone, wave at me. Good. So go on Kingdom Faith Church and hit the share button. Kingdom Faith Church. Multi-king. I think it's a multi-king. I was like, who's the multi-king? Okay, Milton Keynes. Kingdom Faith Church Milton Keynes will come up straight away. And some of you have Facebook followers. Share it there. Some of you have Instagram followers. Share it there. Some of you have uh, WhatsApp family groups. Who has a WhatsApp family group? I do. Everybody has a WhatsApp family group. You always have that auntie that posts an, a joke that's an essay long, and you're like, forget this. I'm not reading that. Just share the link there. And that's how we grow, amen? We grow because we're, we're sharing it together. So if you've shared it, just, just wave at me so I know I can preach. If you haven't shared, I'm still going to wait. Listen, you, I have, you know, I'm going to wait. Everybody, every week, you should share the video. Isn't it crazy that to share the gospel these days, all we have to do is hit a share button. I mean, if Paul was alive today and he had a share button, he would, the things he would do, and, you know, sometimes we just share funny TikTok videos or things we found hilarious. How about we share the gospel? So hit the share button on that. I know I have. We've shared it to our followers. So you, you can do it too. And tell people, subscribe to this channel. Uh, it's, it's a great channel full of great teaching. Okay. Now, if you've done it, wave at me so I can continue. Still off the room. I'll wait. Don't worry. We got okay. Wave at me if you've done it. If you shared it, okay. Wave at me if you haven't shared it. <laughs> Why? She even waved so confidently. Uh -uh. <coughs> Hell now. <laughs> so, so, so she did it with chest. Mm -mm. <laughs> I'm joking. All right. I'm gonna continue. I'm gonna continue. Amen. Uh, I want to finish off. I hope God will let me do this now. I was at such conflict between, you know, the apostle in me sees nine years left as the last prophetic word God gave me. It really spoke, I mean, speaking to me since, but that was a really last significant haunting word I've received. Nine years left. And nine years will fill as nine months, and nine months is nine minutes, and nine minutes is nine seconds. And, um, it's haunted me since, and you know what John Kerry said and Biden said, it was all just spooky. Everybody's saying, we have nine years left to fix the Boris Johnson. We have nine years left to fix the climate. We have nine years left to change things. And, you know, I know because God spoke to me that this would be one of the biggest hoaxes that has ever been played upon mankind. And, um, you know, they're already talking about COVID lockdowns. 
as the, I mean, not COVID, climate lockdowns, which is now the next big um, thing. And so um, I believe it's time for the body of Christ to rise up as a first example of change. And it just so happens that the church, when it moved away from the Catholic movement because of Martin Luther painting the 95th thesis on the All Saints Church, um, he started a movement that now became known as the Protestants. Do you know Protestant come from the word to protest? Do you know the church were the first people to ever really protest and stage protest and be in defiance of something that they knew was against the will of God? And I just challenge whether or not we are slowly steamrolling into that time where the church needs to rise up as a voice again. And um, there is a place for civil disobedience. There, uh, there is a place whether it's where it's better to obey God than to obey man. And I, I know we are coming into that place because whenever government becomes God, that's when we're at the precipice of a changed generation. And we've seen history repeat itself. We've finished a session now where we're talking about how Satan is the god of cosmetics. He's the god of makeup. And it's how we see uh, Obama get into power and all of these. Because first black president, we focused on the cosmetics. And we didn't see beyond the makeup. Now we have first female VP black president. And we're looking at the cosmetics again. And we're failing to see deeper. Don't fall for the cosmetics. The Bible says the spiritual, the hallmark of the spiritual is they discern all things. You cannot be spiritual, call yourself spiritual and lack discernment. And discernment is the greatest, I believe it is the greatest gift the body of Christ needs now more than ever. If you don't have the prophetic, have discernment. At least know something is wrong. You don't have to know what it is. You know, how many of you know? You're just like, something's wrong. I don't know what it is, but something's wrong. You don't have to know what it is. We can give definition to it later. We can put words behind it later. But at least the, the, the knee-jerk, visceral reaction to evil should be enough for us to abstain until somebody comes and creates the language for how we have been feeling for so long. And so I, I want to, um, to start off with... Uh, talking about in my final time with you, and hopefully we'll have time to activate you in this. Um, that's my hope. Again, my I've, I've been in a wrestle with myself. I'm, a, I'm feeling a little bit spiritually schizophrenic between my apostolic side and my prophetic side, and they're both wrestling each other. And one wants to prophesy, but then the other side of me is like, yeah, but we actually need to upgrade the the, the mindset and the and the belief system of the body of Christ and. We can always prophesy to you, but you already know your name. <laughs> Amen? You already know the, the color of your door. You already know all of these things. And I love the prophetic because, you know, the Bible says your gift makes room for you and brings you before important people. And I've seen that happen. But what happens once, you, once room has been made for you? What do you do there? Do you just keep prophesying? And we can keep prophesying, but here's the thing. We cannot prophesy you out of your predicament. In fact, your predicament, your tribulation came because of the revelation. If you really understand that uh, revelation is a setup. Uh, for tribulation, you'd stop asking for so many prophecies because, because you know, you didn't know you were broke until somebody prophesied you were going to be a millionaire. And, and so we find ourselves in a place where, where we think more revelation will help me get a quick exit out of where I am. And actually, it's not more revelation. It's just more obedience upon the revelation you've already received that is going to help you get to that place. And so, Having said that, I want to talk about um, you. I want to talk about you. I want to talk about you, and I want to talk about where uh, God uh, is putting you uh, right now and what is the priority. And um, I covered this slightly last time, um, but I want to give it more meat this time in talking about the anatomy of the prophetic and the makeup of the prophetic and what makes what makes you who you are because if you don't understand uh, your your assignment in the earth 
as the ch the ecclesia, let's call it what it is, as the ecclesia, as the called out ones, um, it's quite easy to fall into the program of church that you miss your effectiveness. And you're actually here to be effective. You're actually here to penetrate culture and to see the kingdoms of the world become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And so that means that it is part of the apostolic assignment to give you spiritual grip and grit so that you know how to create change. One of the nicknames of Elijah the prophet was Troubler of Israel. And I believe you cannot truly be prophetic without being a troublemaker. I don't think that, and I don't mean that in a destructive way. I mean that in a disruptive way. I think that now the world is overdue a disruption. Now, what do I mean? I, God is raising up disruptors in this time, and we're seeing it with new technology. What does Uber do? Uber makes all the black cabs upset because the black cabs did the knowledge, spent years doing something that a sat nav can now do, and now here comes these Uber drivers and these apps, and now you can just call your Uber. You don't even have to talk to your Uber driver because the app tells them where you're going, no awkward conversations, please, just get me where I'm going and out. And that's it. And what did it do? It disrupted something that was already existing but was overdue an upgrade. Now, can I say something? We cannot go back and get back the years we have lost by building uh, each year incrementally. But we can disrupt. And in disruption, what happens is it accelerates because it forces change. Disruption forces change. It forces people to find a new way to navigate. And so I believe God is raising up Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled disruptors who are going to force change through creating disruptions in the earth. And this is why, you know, one of the hallmarks of the prophetic is to tear down, pull down, overthrow, build, and plant. I want you to know I have not run out of steam. There is so much the Lord wants to say. I'm overwhelmed at at the level of things that I believe God wants to say here. And, you know, this is a good ground to say these things. Let me just say this. Uh, the, yesterday, uh, I started by saying that it is in your emergency you discover your essence. And that the essence of the body of Christ is revelation. Why? Because God is looking for a witness. He's not looking for hearsay Christians. And he's not looking for speculative Christians. He's not looking for Christians who heard somebody say, He's not looking for people who assume the mens rea of the God who wrote the scripture. God did not leave the scripture to us to interpret. I know people say that the scripture is up to personal interpretation. I say it is not. I say because we think it is, it has led us to wars. It has led us to all kinds of things in the name of our own personal interpretation of the text. You know, it is the job of, of judges, Supreme Court justices, to interpret the will and the constitution of dead men called the Founding Fathers. God did not let his constitution, he will never let his constitution be determined by men. That is why he gave us the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the revealer of the constitution of heaven. And when we understand he, the Holy Spirit, we understand, we begin to understand how a man called Paul could then go on to write two-thirds of the New Testament Bible, even though he never met the physical Jesus once, because he became a witness of these things. And so, when God speaks, have you noticed when God speaks in Scripture, he always speaks to us as if... Uh, we are kings. He asks us questions like, what's going on with the nations? Why are they raging? And we're like, God, can you pay my phone bill? God's like, why did the nations rage and the people plot in vain? That's not a letter. That's a letter to you. And we look at them and go, okay, God, that's great. But, you know, the electric is coming this month and I'm about, my house is about to be taken. Can you help me just pay that off and, and then we'll talk about nations? It's as if God is talking to his cabinet and he's talking to his executives and he's saying, what are you going to do about this?
And so I want to bring up your level of understanding. Why? Because the Bible says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are from the earth so far, are my thoughts from your thoughts and my ways from your ways. So I want to bring you together into the height of God's mind. Because when you live in the height of God's mind, conversation is no longer strange. Conversation is now understandable because God is not speaking to you as a, as a person who works a nine-to-five shift and three jobs. He's speaking to you as his government. And because he's speaking to you as his government, he's expecting some execution on some of the things he's saying. The communication style of God is revelation. Revelation. Now, what is revelation? Revelation is that which brings an experience that surpasses knowledge. Revelation is that which brings us into an experience that surpasses knowledge. When knowledge of that experience becomes saturated, then experience gives way to theology. Once this happens, God is obligated to set up a new experience. The issue is because the new experience... So let me silence that. The issue is because the new experience surpasses the knowledge of the lost experience. Theology in the minds of those who live by the old experience gives way to religion. Religion is what happens when revelation expires. Every revelation has an expiration date. That is why it is very dangerous to have a prophet come into a town or a city and say, I'll watch it later. Because prophets are not sermonal, they're seasonal. And so you can't really watch a prophetic word later. Neither can you really watch a prophetic word from home. You, you can't really live stream prophetic word because the Bible says you must come into the company of the prophet. So it's not just enough to hear the word of a prophet. The transformation doesn't just happen when you hear the word of the prophet. The transformation begins when you come into the company of the prophet. And so when there is a prophet, when there is an apostle that comes into your region, it is a very laxy daisy attitude to say, I'll watch it later. Because the Bible says the children of Israel, Moses said, go into the land and take possession. And they said, we can't go in because of the giants. And then the Bible says God was angry with them and said they'll wander. But then the Bible says when they heard this, they were cut to the throat. And the Bible says they said, we will go now. And Moses said, don't presume to go now because God is no longer with you. Because every prophetic word has a wind. And if you catch the word, but you didn't catch the wind of the word, you will miss the momentum that can take you to your next place. Doctrines are winds. That's why the Bible says that you're no longer carried by every wind of doctrine. Because doctrines carry winds. Some people follow strange winds. But the righteous follow the prophetic wind. And that's why they're able to ascend to places that most others aren't able to ascend to. Because whenever the prophetic is in town, it's not an ego pop. It's none of those things. The people must be attentive to the momentum of what God is doing and catch it in that moment and be so jealous for it that they're willing to come into the company of it to receive their transformation. It is it's imperative that you understand that I believe that one of our biggest strengths today is technology, but it's also one of our biggest weaknesses, and it is because of technology and because of social media, we think that we can capture God moments on live streams. And let me tell you something, you can only capture so much from home. There, there are encounters that you must come into. There are, there are encounters that you must be present in the room for. There are certain transformations that can only happen when you come into the company of the prophetic. And so I'm going to teach on this very quickly. I want to talk about the anatomy of the prophetic. The anatomy of the prophetic is broken into three tiers. Three tiers. Well, really there are four, but I'm going to say three, um, but I'm going to give the final one to you in a minute. The first tier, and I write about this in Eat, Sleep, Prophecy, I Repeat, so please do get the book if you want more. The first tier that I have encountered in the prophetic is the spirit of prophecy. This is in no chronology, by the way. 
the spirit of prophecy. The second tier is the office of the prophet. It's one we're most common with, the office of the prophet. The third tier is the gift of prophecy. And I said there's a final one, and it is this final one that I believe every single person should want to be in. It's called the friend of God. I'm going to say it again. The spirit of prophecy, the office of the prophet, the gift of prophecy, and the friend of God. I want to start today by talking very quickly about the spirit of prophecy. If you will allow me, I would love to do that. Uh, The Bible says in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, John begins to worship an angel. And the angel looks at John and says, see to it that you do not do that. I am your servant, your fellow servant, and of your brothers that hold the testimony or the witness. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. The Holy Spirit, his first office is prophet. The first office of the Holy Spirit is prophet. He is a prophet. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no prophecy. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no revelation. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has revealed to those that love him, but God has revealed these things to us by his spirit. So the spirit is the revealer. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no revelation. Without the Holy Spirit, I can see Jesus and not see Jesus. There is a reason why in the inner court the menorah must light on the showbread. You cannot have the showbread, which is Christ, without the menorah, which is the Spirit. The Spirit must come on the showbread because the Spirit shows you the dimensions of Christ. Without the Spirit, you can see Jesus and not see Jesus. There's a veil. I've met many believers who still have a veil across their face. They can see Jesus, but they can't see Jesus. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus appeared to them, but they were kept from seeing Jesus. Because you can see him and not see him. We discovered this with the ten lepers. They can see him and not see him. A woman, a Samaritan woman, we can go on, the Samaritan woman, she saw Jesus, but she was still waiting for Jesus. How can you see him and not see him? Because without the Holy Ghost, You can see Jesus and not see Jesus. The Holy Spirit makes Jesus known. The Holy Spirit makes Jesus known. He is the revealer of Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. But no one comes to Jesus except through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes Jesus known. Jesus makes the Father known. He is called the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit because the whole, in the Holy Spirit is the trinity of God. In the Holy Spirit is the relationship of God. In the Holy Spirit is a fellowship, a kononia, if I can say the Greek word properly, that causes me to come into a place of fellowship and relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is our first realm. I wish I had a whiteboard. Do you, do you have a whiteboard here? That's probably a, that's a stretch. Don't worry about the whiteboard. Let's... let's, let's I want to, can we do some school? Can we do some biblical mathematics? Some of you are like, no more mathematics, please. Okay, I'm going to try and do this in my, in my mind, okay? Let's go to the book of uh, Jeremiah chapter 1. Somebody who's there before me, just read it. Just read it out loud. There's a lot to go through, so please be very quick if you're there before me. Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Before I what? I what? Before I what? I. 
<laughs> Underline the word formed. Psalm 139 verse 16. Somebody go there quickly. Psalm 139 verse 16. If you're there before me, just read it. Your eyes saw what? What? What does that mean? Underline the word formed again. Somebody turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5. Such people... From such people turn away. Watch this. <laughs> uh, he said, stay away from people who are churchy but not spiritual. Those are the people we invite every Sunday, by the way. <laughs> but Paul said, stay away from folk. Not, not, he's not talking about desperate, raging sinners. He's like, stay away from folk who look churchy act churchy, sound churchy, but have no power. From such people, from powerless people, stay away. Look at your neighbor. <laughs> and tell him, I got the power. <laughs> okay. He says, he's, I mean, Paul goes as far as saying, listen, stay away from powerless Christians. Underline the word again, form. Romans 12, verse 2. Somebody who's there, read it. 12, verse 2. If you know it, you can shout it. Do not be... Underline the word form. How many times have you seen the word form? Four times at least. There's more scriptures with the word form in it, but those are the ones I want you to focus on. Just those four. Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Before I formed you, I knew you. Psalm 1, 3, 9. He knew my unformed substance. Romans 12 verse 2. Do not be conformed. 2 Timothy 3 verse 5. Having a form of godliness but denying the power have nothing to do with such people. What does this mean and how does this pertain to the spirit of prophecy? And here's a bigger question that we must ask ourselves. How does God know me before I was formed? And not only that, Psalm 139 says he wrote a book about me before I was formed. And in this book, he wrote everything I was going to do. He says to Jeremiah, before I formed you, I knew you, and I ordained you a prophet. Who is you? I thought, this is me. The question is, who is you? Look at your neighbor and say, who is you? Who is you? Oh, you have a board. Thank you. This is perfect. The, don't worry. The, the leg is... The leg is... But we have one. This is good. This is helpful. This is helpful. I want to do some... I want to do some schooling, if that's okay. Um, thank you. So, let's, let's go here. Ger Genesis chapter 1. Let's, let's figure out... Let's figure out this stuff. And let's do some maths and see where we get to. Genesis 1. Now, remember, we spoke about these three realms, the spirit of prophecy, the gift of prophecy, and the office of the prophet. And we can talk about a fourth one, the friend of God. Uh, these are the four people that exist in the spiritual world, if you will. Uh, but let's look at this. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. So uh, Elohim created the Shemayim, the heavens, of which we know of three. 
and the Eretz, which is the earth. Now, the earth was tohu bohu. That means formless and void. Now, God, uh, in, 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 I think in, in, in uh, Job, says the Lord who created the earth did not create it tohu bohu, but created it to be inhabited. And so it's from this that we understand that something happened between Genesis 1 verse 1 and Genesis 1 verse 2 to make the earth tohu bohu. And if we go to Revelation, we begin to understand some of what happened. There was a war in heaven and Lucifer was thrown out of heaven. And then we had a Luciferian flood. And the Luciferian flood was to drive out these, um, these uh, demonic uh, angels not demons. Angels, fallen angels are not demons. I know we have that belief system. They're not the same thing. So these fallen angels were thrown out and then there was a flood because God always cleanses with a flood. And so when the flood happened, we all believed that maybe there was an ice age because when there's no sun, water turns into ice. When the spirit is brooding over the face of the waters, the waters begin to melt. And so science and the Bible don't contradict. If you understand, they can support one another very well. So we look at Genesis 1 verse 1, we look at Genesis 1 verse 2, and there's this gap between the two, and it's Revelation that fills out that gap. Now, if you understand the book of Genesis, you will understand that God loves science, because Genesis is where we get the word genes from. The book of Genesis is a book of your DNA. And this is why our Theology and our education often contradict because the goal of Darwin was to change your genesis. Darwin told you you came from a monkey and, or uh, amoeba, like jelly substance. Oh, first there was a big explosion, right? And you know, I've never seen an explosion create anything, but there was an explosion. And apparently this explosion was different from every other explosion because instead of causing mass destruction, it caused creation. I mean, just think about this glorious, glorious big bang. And who created the big bang? It created itself, silly, duh. And then when this, ex because I mean, explosions just happen. Nobody detonates anything or puts anything together. This thing just happened to happen. And then this explosion created this amoeba and this jelly-like substance all of a sudden became some kind of amphibious creature and crawled on land and then became kind of uh, uh, monkey, 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 man, man, Neanderthal, 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 and then became a full-grown person. And that's why we share 98% similarities with the orangutan. I don't know about you, but I never seen no chimpanzee get a nine-to-five job and become a human being. I know some people act like monkeys, but I still never seen it. So I am, you know, it takes more faith for me to believe that I came from an explosion than for me to believe that I am made in the image and likeness of God. I choose to believe the latter. But look at this. Genesis, for those of you who believe this with me, Genesis is a book of your genes. That's why it says in the beginning or the origins. It's a, it's a genetic model that helps you to understand the creator God and how he creates. The first thing God needs to create is light. The first thing God needs to create... My wife is here. Just give her a God bless you. Welcome. The, the, the first thing God needs to create is light. Somebody say light. What is light? Light is revelation. God cannot create without revelation. God cannot create without revelation. That is why. And somebody think that light is from the sun. That light was not from the sun. The sun was created on the third day. This light, when he said, let there be light, this was the light of revelation. Without revelation, you and I cannot build anything. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builder builds it in vain. Unless the Lord watches the city, the watchman wakes up in vain. Now, even the builder, God is a builder, but he is a builder only after a blueprint. Everything God builds, he builds from a blueprint and a prototype. And so you must understand that heaven and earth operate like this. This is earth and this is heaven. So this is why it's important to say in the beginning, God, Elohim, I hope we have a rubber to rub this out in the end because I need more space on it. God created the heaven or tissue would be fine. God created the heaven and the earth and he separated them with what is called a firmament. Right? Are you with me so far? Very important that you understand this. Now, somebody asked me, what does heaven look like? You can ask me. Thank you. 
Heaven looks like earth. What does heaven look like? Heaven looks like earth. Well, what do you mean? Have you noticed when Jesus is with his disciples, the disciples, he stops them and says, hey, so can you teach us how to pray? Because, I mean, when we pray, nothing much happens. But when you pray, dangerous things happen. So he says, okay, let me teach you how to pray. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. As it is. Everything in earth is as it is in heaven. God never makes anything on earth that is not already in heaven. Never. Everything in earth is as is in heaven. So suffice to say, if we can do some, phys- some spiritual physics, heaven is a parallel dimension of earth. Heaven runs parallel to the earth. Like this. Have you ever studied parallel dimensions? This is heaven and earth. They run like a parallel dimension. This is why when Jesus was asked about the kingdom of heaven, he always spoke in what's called parables. Because parable comes from the word parallel fable. I told you there's more. Parabole mean parallel fable. So God is using our realm to describe his realm because they are parallel dimensions of one another. Every parallel dimension, if you've ever watched kids' movies, is always separated by a mirror. Hello? Right? You know, you watch the movies and you look and there's another world with you, but you're, you're, you're rich instead of who you are here. Uh, you know, that is the parallel world. That is the parallel universe. We fantasize about these things, but we don't know they came from Scripture. Heaven is a parallel dimension. It's a mirror world of earth. And in fact, if you will believe it, in the beginning, heaven and earth ran like this. They didn't run like this. This is why it was not morning and evening the first day. It was evening and morning the first day. Follow me. Okay, so this is what he says. He says, I am Alpha and, not or. God sits in the beginning and he sits at the end. And because of his Omega realm, he is capable of declaring the Omega from the Alpha. That's what Isaiah says. And this is why if you're a prophet, you must live in the Omega realm. Because God says the vision speaks of the Omega. The vision speaks of the end. Any prophetic word God gives you speaks of the end. Prophetic people are the most frustrated people on planet earth for one reason. Because they believe everything God says should happen now. And yet God shows Joseph the moon and the stars bowing down to him. But in the editing suite, he seems to omit Potiphar's wife. He seems to omit he'll be accused of rape. He seems to omit that he didn't commit the rape, but he'll be in prison for years. He says, edit that out of the, of the film. Please get this out. Please get the workplace harassment out. Please get the, uh, the incarceration out. Please get the fact that his brothers will betray him out. Please get the fact that his mama, and Joseph was a mama's boy. Please get the fact that his mama will die whilst he's incarcerated and he'll never get seen. And then he'll have another boy called Ben that he'll never get to see until he's mature. Let, let's get rid of all of that. So God will speak to you and he'll say, hey, you're going to, men and stars are going to bow down to you. And you're like, amen, God. Oh, let it be according to your will. And then ah, you're like, God, <laughs> what's going on? You know, this is not what you said. God declares the end. He doesn't declare the process. Because if he told you the process... You wouldn't go. That's God. He'll tell you, I know the thoughts I have towards you. Thoughts are good and not of evil to give you an expected end. Not an expected process. 
So God will declare the end from the beginning because that's God. He, he lives in the evening. So he can declare the evening and morning. He speaks it into being. And so you must understand that in the beginning, heaven and earth were running like two very parallel lines from evening to morning. They were running like that very well to the point that everything that existed in the beginning existed as a harvest. There was no such thing as babies in the beginning. Adam was an adult. Eve was an adult. Because as long as heaven and earth remained in agreement, there was no need for seed. God didn't plant a seed. He planted a garden. Are you with me? He didn't plant seed bearing fruit. He planted fruit bearing seed. Because when you live in the Omega realm, you are living in harvest. God did not create Adam and Eve for seed. Are you with me? How would they have children? I don't know. He's God, but they would have had a harvest. They would never have had seeds. I thought you said, he said, be fruitful and multiply. Isn't that, isn't that what we believe that they're supposed to be fruitful? This was not a statement of procreation. This was a, this was a dominion mandate. God was giving them five steps to dominion. And if you follow these five steps, you'll succeed. Most Christians try to multiply when they haven't even borne any fruit. God told me that I'm called to nations, so I have a ministry here, I have a ministry here. You haven't even borne fruit in the one ministry you have, and you want to multiply it everywhere. You can't upscale failure. So there was evening and morning the first day. There was evening and morning the first day. Why? Because God lives in the perpetual omega realm. He lives in a perpetual harvest. So there's no seed. And God did not ordain Adam and Eve to sow seed. He ordained them to live in perpetual harvest. Now, if you understand this, God creates the heavens and the earth. And so he wants man to rule the earth. So here's what God does. He says, let's make animals after their kind. What kind? What kind? The one in heaven. Hello. So he gets the, the genome of the animals in heaven. And he looks at the one in heaven, looks at the one on earth, It's good. Then God says, let's make plants after their kind. Which kind? He gets the genesis of the plant kind and simulates it in the earth. Let's make insects. Does the same thing after their kind. So see, there's spiders in heaven. Yeah. I don't know if they have eight legs. I think that was the fall, but they're spiders. <laughs> Maybe they're pretty. You know, snakes talked in the beginning. So maybe they, and they were beautiful, the Bible says. So, you know, I don't know what they are now with this fallen thing. Spiders, you know, everything just turned ugly. But these things were not the same. I guess before the fall, they were perfect in symmetry and in parallel to heaven. Right? Now, this is going to pertain to prophecy in a minute. They were separated by a firmament, but the firmament was open. It was open sky. There was no veil. There was no dividing line between heaven and earth. So God says, let us make insects, animal kind, plant kind, all of the kinds. Then God comes to a place in 126. He says, let us make us. Because God makes everything on earth as it is in heaven, even himself. This is important. God says, let's make us. And the same way I have an Adam up here, let's make another Adam down here. Just like me. Watch this. So God did something very interesting. 
In Genesis 1.26, God creates himself. <laughs> he did something he never did with any of the other animals. God creates himself. And let me tell you where he creates himself. He creates himself here. Adam did not exist here. Adam existed here. I'm going to explain it. I'm going to explain it. Adam existed here. And then God said to himself, be fruitful, multiply, replenish here, subdue here, and have dominion as long as you stay here. Watch me. This is very important. Dominion was not given to this man. Dominion was given to this man. Genesis 1.26, God makes himself. Are you following me? This is very important. Very important. This man was equal in power, strength, and might to God. And the Bible says so much so that God blessed him. I wish I could tell you what the word blessed means, but you might accuse me of heresy. Should I tell you? I'm going to tell you anyway. The word bless in the Greek is the word, in the Hebrew is the word barak. It does not mean to speak a benediction. It means to action the benediction. It means, the original word means to kneel. It means to kneel as if conferring like authority to. So when God blessed Adam, all of creation would have seen God blessing himself. And would have said, if God is blessing this guy, he must be worthy of the same esteem and honor as this guy. And God said, as long as I salute him, creation must salute him as well. Watch this. So in Genesis 2 verse 7, here's where you're going to get it. Genesis 2 verse 7. Somebody's there, read. Read it, 2 verse 7. Someone leave the next page. Who's there? He did what? He did what? How many times have you heard the word form now? Five times. Are you with me? Before I formed you, I knew you. Are you getting this? Genesis 2 is Adam's formation. Genesis 1 is Adam's creation. Adam was created in God's image, formed from the dust. He was a dual citizen. The only one of God's creation to be here and here at the same time. Watch this. Watch this. I'm going to ask you a question. If I asked you, let me rub this out. I'll come back to this. If I asked you to draw me. Somebody, who wants to be a volunteer? Who wants to draw? Who's, who's interested? Who's good at drawing? Okay, sir. Good, 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 sir. Okay, I'm going to ask you to draw me a two-dimensional person. Two-dimensional person. Good, good. Okay, okay. God help this guy. Wow, wow, wow. Whoa, whoa, hair. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Who? Wait. What am I seeing here? What am I seeing here? What is this? He's upside. Okay, okay. That was, that was really cute. Okay. Let's do this again. I get what you're doing. Okay, so just draw a man 2D. Draw one, just draw one of them. One of them. Stick man if you want to. 
good, good. So that's a 2 dB. Not really, but let's say he is because he's on a flat surface. What makes him 2D? Huh? Volume, give me another word. Who said it? Somebody said it. it begins with D. No depth. He's 2D because he has height. He understands the concept of height. He understands the concept of length, but he doesn't understand the concept of depth. Am I right? Now, Pastor is this man's creator. What makes him his creator? He drew him. What else? He lives outside his dimension. Isn't it interesting how people say, if God is real, where is he? You don't look for Steve Jobs in the Apple computer. Oh, Jesus. Creators don't live in their creation. What makes a creator a creator is they live outside of their creation. Am I right? So God is greater. Why is God greater? Because he lives outside of the dimension of his work. Just like I don't look for Bill Gates in a Microsoft computer. Just like I don't look for Steve Jobs in an Apple computer. I'm not looking for God in this world. His dimension is bigger than mine and that's what makes him greater. What makes me a creator of this man is I live in a greater, more superior dimension to him. Some of you have friends that you say, my friend is two-faced. God has angels that are four-faced. You're boasting that your friend is two-faced. God's like, have you seen my friends? They're four-faced. Why? Because God is so multidimensional that angels need multiple faces just to grab a hold of his dimension. So us with our puny 3D minds say, well, where's God if he's real? He lives outside of your dimension. That's what makes him a creator. Now, does anybody have a ball? A ball or something? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm going to explain something. What makes us greater is we live outside of the dimension of work. Or anything that's 3D. Anything that's 3D. Okay, the ball is coming. The ball is a better illustration for me to use. What makes him great is he lives outside of his dimension. God created Adam to live in God's dimension. Adam, if you and I were looking at Adam, we would have seen this. How do I know we would have seen this? Because when the eyes of them both were opened, if their eyes were opened, that's, guess what their eyes were before? Closed. So how could they see with their eyes closed? You see, what we call prophetic now was not prophetic to them. It was sight. They didn't see into the spirit. They saw from the spirit. There are some things I want to explain to you so that you can understand how the prophetic works. Everything in the garden was a perpetual harvest. Nothing was a seed. Adam never needed to sow seed because heaven and earth were so parallel and in such congruence that there was no need for harvest to metastasize itself in the earth as seed. Harvest could just pass through seamlessly into the earth. Seamlessly, without any, without any structural change. I want to explain this. I wish I had that ball very quickly. 
um, but it's taken a while. So somebody give me another 3D object. Any 3D object you have will do. Yeah, that bottle is fine. Bottle is fine. Okay. I told you we're going to do some biblical, is it physics or maths? I don't know which one. I didn't finish school, so I don't know. Okay, so you do not want to give this bottle. I'm going to make it very clear because some people are going to tell me how to give the bottle to this person. You don't want to give this bottle to this person. That's not your assignment. Your assignment is to show this person that you've created that this is a bottle. Now, if I do this, what will this man see? Uh, he'll see a, uh, if I did this, he'll just see a, a dot getting bigger and bigger and bigger. He'll call it a UFO, right? Because he has no depth. Are you guys with me? So how do I just show? How do I, how do I show this object? I don't, I'm not yet giving it to him. Oh, the ball cake. Thank you. Thank you. That's perfect. Oh, no. Uh, I'll use the squishy one. Better. Thank you. Let's use this ball. Thank you. Whose is this? Water. I don't want to. Thank you. How do I show this? I just want to show him that it's a ball I want to give him. How do I show him? Huh? No, that's giving it to him. How do I show him? See, I said some people. Say it again. Who said it? Was that you? What did you say? Oh, man. This is, give him a round of applause. I mean, that's it. If I, get the, if I get the light right, a shadow can show him what I'm trying to give him. This is why the Bible calls the Old Testament a shadow. Because God is casting light onto our dimension to try and show us this is what I'm trying to do. But even in our 3D superiority, we are inferior to God. Because I'm trying to show you. Good. Now, okay, you're already 10 steps ahead of me. <laughs> 10 steps ahead. Thank you, sir. Now imagine now I want to give this ball, this ball to him. Now, I've shown him. Now, if I show him, what does it make him? What was it? Witness or seer. He's a prophet. At that moment, he's a prophet. Why? Because, here's the thing. Revelation trumps information. You can have information... But revelation is the key to influence. Nothing is new under the sun. And so we'll run out of ideas. We'll run out of movies. We'll run out of scripts. So we recycle everything. But when you're a prophet, you grab something outside of the dimension and you pull it in. Because everything is new above the sun. Who lives above the sun? God. So revelation comes... And now because you're carrying revelation, not even education, just revelation, you have the greatest level of influence. Write this down. The one with the revelation carries the greatest level of influence. If you ever want to influence nations, it is this secret, revelation. Revelation. The Bible says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children. Revelation is God's greatest gift to you. Have you ever noticed why God would tell the children of Israel, I'm going to destroy Egypt and I'm going to give you so much money that overnight the wealth of a superpower will be turned over to peasants. And it happens. And now they are rich with all of the wealth of Egypt on their children and on their own feet. Imagine dirty wrists wearing gold bangles. And they're saying, okay, God, where are we going? Dubai? Are we going to Harrods? And God takes them to a wilderness. No cash machines. No Gucci stores. 
a desert. They looked at God and they said, why? Why did you give us all this money if we can't spend it? They got so frustrated that they even built a gold cow. Because what else do you do with gold in a place you can't spend it? I said, why, God? And God said, I did this deliberately. Because God will deliberately and divinely under-resource you. Because the, your greatest resource is resourcefulness. Some people are so over-resourced that they're under-resourceful. That's our biggest problem in Nigeria. Our biggest problem in Nigeria is not the lack of resources. Our biggest problem in Nigeria is we have too many resources. It's too much oil that's killing us. I wish I had somebody to help me today. And so God will deliberately and divinely in his kingdom economics, he will deliberately under-resource you to produce resourcefulness in you. Hillary Clinton spent billions on her campaign. Donald Trump only spent millions. And they laughed at him and said, this man is not going to win. He knows nothing about politics. How did a man spend less and win because the race is not so swift and all the battles are strong? You can have many resources, but the one who wins is the most resourceful. So here's them in the wilderness. They're like, God, why did you bring us out here to die? And God said, I, God said this is what God said. God said, tell them I starved you. Oh, you don't know about that, God. You're like, God is a God of prosperity. I will prosper in Jesus' name. No, God will starve you. That's what he said. Tell them, I starved you. I fed you with manna, which neither you nor your children loved. I gave you what you didn't even like. Why? He says that I might show you. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth. Not the book. I love the book. I love the book. But I live by what he says, not by what I read. We have starving Christians who go to church and hear the word of God, but have never heard from the God of the word. And they're malnutritioned because they haven't heard God speak. God's voice is the food of the spirit. God knows what nourishes the human spirit, and it's the voice of God. So watch this. He says, things revealed belong to us. Oh, there's a bull's name. How do I now give this bull to this being? I show it by revelation. Now, how do I give it? Because God says, I say what I'm about to do, then I do it. So God doesn't, God is not a diagnoser. He's not into diagnosis. You know, he reveals to redeem. So if I show you it, my law says I must give you what I show you. That's why I said to Elisha, if you'll see me when you're take, I'm taken from you, you'll have it. But if you don't see me, you won't have it. Sight are the hands of the spirit. In order for me to seize it, I must see it. If I can't see it, I can't have it. And this is why Satan doesn't need to blind your hands or bind your feet. He just needs to blind the eyes of the unbelieving. Because if your spiritual eyes can't see it, you'll never have access. You'll play religion instead of revival. Watch this. So how do I give this, how do I give this ball now? How do I give it to him? Now I've let him see it with a shadow. Now how do I give it to him? What happened? Why did it bounce? He can't take it. Why can't he take it? No depth. He's outside of my dimension. Now you're understanding the God dilemma. How do I give it to him? That revelation revealed it to him. Now how do I give it to him? I have to go in. Watch this. So I have to redraw. Now, I can redraw it to look exactly the same, but it will be a seed form of what it originally looks like in my dimension. 
Are you with me? It will be a lesser glory. This is a greater glory. That will be a lesser glory. In the beginning, it was nothing like that. In the beginning, if God wanted to give you a ball, give you a ball. You take it. Harvest. Take it. Because Adam and God lived on the same dimension. Now, when the Bible says he made us a little lower than himself, what's he talking about? Genesis 2. The flesh. God creates us in his image and he forms us of the dust. And the Bible says he breathed into the nostrils of his formation the breath of life. And the man became a living nefesh, a living soul. God blessed him. I need two Adams. Two Adams. Two men. Two men. Two men. Thank you, sir. Good. Just come and stand with me here. And stand with me here. I could just imagine they look the same. <laughs> stand here. Face the audience, if you will. So God creates him in Genesis 1. God forms him in Genesis 2. And it forms him of the dust of the ground. So he's now Adam is three dimensional, but he's also fourth dimensional. And the fourth dimension was his first dimension. The three dimensional world is his Earth Day, not his birthday. Are you with me? This is not his birthday. This is his earth day. Now this man, close your eyes. This man's eyes were closed. He was, he was physically dead. Spiritually alive. Now God brings the animals. Now God says to this man, watch this. God says to this man, God says to creation, this is your mission. Then God says to this man, this is your submission. Watch this. I'm going to explain this. God did not create a wife for him. He doesn't need one. When God said it's not good for the man to be alone, he wasn't talking about him. He was talking about him. If I wanted to... Buy Beyonce's music. How do I know I have it? Listen to it where? On what? iPhone, good. What else? TV, good. What else? Some said Alexa. Come on, can we go a bit old school? Can somebody? Everybody's all in. Cassettes, thank you. Oh, you're making me feel old. Oh, MP3, Alexa, Siri, duh. Right? Okay. So, goodness me, how far have we come? I'm like cassette, CD, DVD, good. All of the, a record, vinyl. Woo, I missed that. That was, mm -hmm, that was music. When you put it in the thing. MP3s. Darn, how have we missed all this stuff? So, so that's how I used to play it. Now, is the CD Beyonce? No. no. What's on the CD is Beyonce. Can I get an Eve? Anybody want to be an Eve? Thank you. <laughs> God form. God formed them, created him, formed them. Watch this. These two are merely formats of this person. The format is not important. The flesh profits nothing. It's the God on the format that makes the format anything. 
So we got people, just stand next to each other, please. We got people worshiping the format. So somebody said to me, tell me, how, how, how did the LGBT thing happen? When people stop worshiping the creator and you start worshiping the created thing, the Bible says God gives you over. Watch this. Watch this. So, so God creates, forms them. And God says it's not good for them to be alone. Now, he gives him a mission, dominion, and he gives them a submission, domestic. Have you noticed something? Have you noticed Paul in Ephesians spends a whole chapter talking about this person? He says, he says listen to what he says. He says, can you please, can you, can you just love her? No, no, please. just No, no, don't love her for her. I know, I get it. She's annoying. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. Don't love her for her. Just love her as I love the church. And gave my life for her. Please, just do it. Just do it. And girl, can you respect him? I know, I know he wears the same underwear for the past week. I know you've watched him sniff it to see if he can wear it. I know. <laughs> but can you just respect him as unto me? And, and, and you kids, can you just honor, your, just honor them? I know sometimes they, I mean, and, and daddy, please don't provoke him to wrath. Stop irritating him. Stop pressuring him to be you. He's not you. He'll never be you. Just let him be himself. And you, you guys at work, can you just stop stealing pens? Please just love your boss. <laughs> I mean, stop it. And yeah, stop doing eye service. You bosses, please stop uh, turning them into Kunta Kente because your God is their God too. And, and then he sighs this sigh of relief. Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord. For we were never wrestling here. Most people have never come to their dominion mandate because they're making demons out of their domestic mandate. And then every Sunday we write books and preach messages to deal with this person that we never come to this person. And meanwhile, the enemy is rewriting gender, rewriting marriage, changing policies, whilst our pastor's time is deadlocked trying to get you to stay married. We're making a mission out of the sub-mission. whole church is devoted to this whole ministry is devoted to this and Paul's like can we get here can we get to why we're really here we were never here to fight parents we were here to fight principalities and the enemy has the church scruffling and fighting over this person that we never actually do what this person was here to do dominion is your mission Marriage, kids, wife, that is your submission. And if there's anybody who can live without the submission, God says, do it! Somebody said to me, what's God's perfect will? Who's God's perfect will for my life? Please just tell me who's God's perfect will for my life. I said, do you want to know? He said, yes. I said, God's perfect will for you is that you never get married. And then somebody said, why would you say that? Why would you say that? I said, because that's what the Bible says. Because your focus, exactly, it will shift. Somebody came to me one day and said, please, man of God, pray for me. I said, what's wrong? They said, I've got trouble in my marriage. I said, well, that sounds about right. Sounds like you're right on time. Because 
Because Paul said the one who wants to be married will have trouble. Trouble. So why go through it? Huh? I'm telling you, it's trouble. It's wonderful. Uh, but it's trouble. Marriage is trouble. Hey, single people in church look at married people. Oh. Married people look at single people and they go, oh. I see it. I see it. Every Sunday I see single people look at married people. I see married people look at single people. And they're both envying each other. Because single people want to be married again. Married people want to be single. <laughs> so says, anybody who can accept this, don't do this part. It will get in the way of this part. But if you can't handle being alone, two are better than one. And if you burn in your flesh, marriage is a great solution, by the way. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just telling you some real truths, you know. Everyone says, you'll be married in Jesus' name. I said, please, don't say amen to every prayer. <laughs> 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 Woo! Jesus is Lord. Marriage? Kai. <laughs> ask my wife, no, ask her. Being married to me, God bless her. <sighs> it's grace to be married to me. I look at her and I say, I don't envy you. <laughs> it's tough. When she barely sees me, I'm traveling, and when I'm back, I put my sock on the floor. She just tidied the whole house for me. My sock goes there, my shoe goes there, my other shoe goes there. And she goes, how do you find these clothes? I say, I know exactly where I put them. And if you move them, you mess with my program. I call it organized chaos. <laughs> oh. but the problem is we make a mission out of the submission why is the toilet seat up why can't you put the toilet seat down when you finish it do you love me tell me you love me when was the last time you told me you love me Meanwhile, people are dying. They're going to hell in a handbasket. And we're looking at each other. And marriage becomes the place where suddenly adults become children again. Call me baby. I want to be the little spoon. And I can just imagine God looking, going, <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> but this was just the submission. And God says, if you can live without this part, please, by all means, if you can live without having kids or live without having a spouse, or, he, he bless it too. Somebody thinks they're cursed because they're single. There's some people who think they're cursed because they're married. Listen. <laughs> hey, I'm going to leave. I don't know. I don't know how we got here. I got I to gotta marry. I don't know how I got here. Please, let me, let me just marry. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. No, you can stay here with me. Good, good, good. So there was no separation. Okay, wonderful. Watch this. One day, Eve... A snake comes to Eve, and it's not an apple. I know it's not an apple, but a snake comes to Eve and says, hey, 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 you see this fruit right here? Um, did God say you can't? No, this is what Satan says. Did God say you can't eat of any of the trees of the garden? 
And look what Eve says. He says, no, 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 no. That one. Because Satan doesn't know your weakness. You tell him. I wish, I wish we stopped telling the devil stuff. Huh? No, no, that one. That one over there. God says we can't even touch it. God never said that. God never said don't touch it. He said don't eat it. No, no God said don't even touch. Because if we dare touch, hey. So Satan goes, touch it. Have you changed? Hold it. I said, wow. God's lying. I touch this and I'm, I'm not changing. So she eats it. <laughs> this is good. She gives some to her husband. Eats it. <laughs> Feed him now. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, my time's up, my time's up, watch this, I'm so sorry, I'm misbehaving, I've got to behave myself, watch this, then the Bible says, the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were 3D, they didn't know they were 3D before, they did not live in a realm where they were naked, In that world, they're clothed. In this world, naked. God comes walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, this person has, has died. So God comes walking in the garden in the cool there. And if you check the word cool, it's not a weather report. The word cool is the Hebrew word ruach. It means spirit. Why? Because God is spirit. God comes walking in his dimension and in the dimension that he created them. He looks, he says, Adam! Adam! Where are you? Adam died creation died formation lived so now the challenge has become how do I explain to this person what was once communication to this person and just like I cannot communicate across dimensions. I must reveal dimensions. Now I must reveal dimensions. Are you following this? Because they don't have something that made this one capable of communication. Now I've got to create a whole strand called prophecy. What happened when man fell? When man fell... Morning started, evening continued. Harvest was here. Now, if you want to harvest, you have to sow a seed. From now on, as long as heaven and earth remains. Now, this is why God says, I'll create a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because I need to recreate perpetual harvest. But until then, you got to work. If you want something in this realm, I have to recreate it in your realm. Now, God said, now men became very depraved. And God was like, these guys have lost me. I've given them logic, they're still not getting it. I've written my word, they're still not getting it. I've given them commandments, they're still not getting it. And the Bible says, God so loved the world. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let's talk. I love them, but they're messing up. How can I reach them? How can I save them? I don't want to erase them. I need them. So Jesus said, I'll go. And he said, but there's a problem. If you go, you have to go in their dimension. I can't send you as a harvest. Oh! Oh! 
you have to be born again. And because of their dimension, I have to explain to you on that side things you'll forget on this side. I will have to reform you. Does that mean I'll lose my glory? He said, yeah, yeah. You won't be able to take any of the things you have here into that realm. And so God said, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being equal with God, counted it not robbery, but stripped himself of his glory, stepped into our dimension, born of a woman. Why? Because he needed to be a seed. He needed to be born into our dimension. When he came into our dimension, thank you, you can sit down. He meets a man called Nicodemus. He says, Nicodemus goes, <laughs> Nicodemus says, wow, man, teacher, you are sent by God. Because no one can do the miracles you're doing unless God is with him. And he says, well, let me tell you something. Unless you're born again, you can't, you can't enter this. He says, what? He says, well, unless you're born of the spirit and water, you can't see my dimension. He says, what are you saying? Do I go back into my mother's womb and come back out again? He says, no. He says, first of all, you're nasty, Nicodemus. <laughs> Second of all, no. He says, you don't. He says, you must understand flesh gives birth to flesh. But spirit gives birth to spirit. And so if you're born of the spirit, you'll go back to Genesis. You'll go back to who you were. And you'll see from that place again. But if you live in the flesh, you'll die. And so Jesus came into our world to bring us back into his world. Now watch this. This is very important. So he comes in Genesis, Jeremiah, and he says, Hey, Jeremiah, before I formed you, I knew you. Before I Genesis 2'd you, I Genesis 1'd you, and I ordained you as a prophet. But then said I. Because every time God speaks, he doesn't speak to your flesh. He speaks to your spirit. He doesn't speak to your formation. He speaks to your creation. So when God says, Elizabeth, you're going to have a child, he wasn't talking about the frailty of her body. He was talking about the power of her spirit. And so every time God speaks... He's not speaking to this guy because eyes have not seen, ears haven't heard. The heart of Genesis 2 cannot understand the things. Why can't he understand? Because they're outside of his dimension. So God, spirit has to reveal to spirit. God reveals it by his spirit. Every time God reveals it by his spirit, the flesh hinders him. So God says in the end times, people will accept this guy. They'll go to church in this guy. They'll hear sermons about this guy, but they'll deny this guy. And so what we have today is the seeker-sensitive Genesis 2 form of godliness. This great, big, supine, protoplasmic, invertebrate, jelly Christianity that has denied this guy. We have smoke machines and skinny jeans, but no power. And everybody's coming to be entertained, but nobody's coming to transform anything. I don't mind your excellence. I don't mind your stuff. This is what, God, this is what Paul meant. You see, because every time God speaks to creation, formation always speaks. And this is why the prophetic has a real issue in the earth. The prophetic has a real issue in the earth because this guy cannot fulfill destiny. This guy must fulfill destiny. So for whom he did for know, he also did predestined to be conformed into the image 
because his, the image of his son is really his image because God created us in his image. So God's like, I'm trying to get you back to this guy. Joseph can't fulfill God's destiny. Only God's image can fulfill God's destiny. So God is trying to make you into him. So God says, I'll make all things work together. No. It's not working for your good. I know we sing, all things are working for my good. It's not working for your good. Can I, this is why many people backslide. Most people backslide because they, they read scripture wrong. And they think all things are working for my good. It's not working for your good. The Bible actually says it's working for the good. I wish I could preach about this a little bit. But it's not working for your good. It's working for the good. And so you look at it and you go, this isn't good for me. And God's like, it wasn't meant to be good for you. It was meant to be good for me. <laughs> so how is it good for God and not good for you? Well, here's God and he says, Joseph. Joseph was the one that coined that phrase because he said, you meant it for harm, but God meant it for good. How did this happen? Well, jo God gives Joseph a dream and in this dream, the moon and the stars are bowing down to him and corns of wheat are bowing down to him and everything is bowing down to him. He thinks, wow, I'm really great. Everything's going to bow down to me. But God never showed him the rape accusation. God never showed him the betrayal. God never showed him that he would be in jail. God never showed him that his mom would die. God used, let me tell you something God told me, you know, because I used to sing that song, all things are working for my good, he's intentional, never failing, I love the song, don't get me wrong, keep singing it, great song, but you must understand, it's not working for your good, I looked at it and I said, God said to me, tell me, what if I'm, I'm working all things out for your good, I said, God, that's great. I love you working all things out for my good. That's what the scripture says. He says, but tell me, what if I'm working it out for the good of those that love me? I said, that's great. Of course, you're working it out for the good of those that love you. He said, tell me, third question, what if those that love me hate you? The church is getting quiet. Oh, gosh. Especially the Africans who believe your enemies will some assault. Um, let me... Let me explain it to you. God is the divine orchestrator of life. And sometimes there are people who love God, but they don't like you. And you make them your enemy, and God never made them his enemy. And you assume that they should be God's enemy too, because they're your enemy. And so one day I beheld in a vision... These two people fighting and arguing with each other back and forth. Both of them Christians. Both of them loved God. But they're fighting each other vehemently. And I stood in the middle and God looked at me and said, one of them was saying, he must die in Jesus' name. The other one was saying, he must die in Jesus' name. And God looked at me and said, which one's mine? This is a vision. I said, God, they're, they're both yours. And he said, so who should I defend? Watch this. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you and say all wicked kind of things against you. Why? Not as a sign of passivity. For by doing so, you prove. I wish I could get a witness here. For by doing so, you prove that you're children of my father. By doing so, I can tell who I'm going to defend. Because God makes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He doesn't withhold rain because somebody said they're transgender. He'll still bless the transgender and he'll still bless the believer. So God, what if God was working out for Joseph's good, but he was also working out for Judah's good? Judah who chucked him in there. And he was also working it out for Pharaoh's good. And Potiphar's good. And everybody who in his narrative was an enemy. What if forgiveness is your incarceration? And it takes prophetic perspective. Have you ever read Psalm 119? The Bible says in Psalm 119, he sent forth a man before him, Joseph. When I looked at it in, in Genesis, Joseph wasn't sent. Joseph was sold. But what if your sellout is your send out? 
what if those who sold you out were really promoting you? And if they had not have sold you out, you would never have been sent out. And instead of being angry at them, you ought to be forgiving them and thanking them because had it not been for them, you would not be who you are and where you are today. I'm almost done. So God says, He says, do not be conformed to the cosmetics. I love looking at this church because in this church I see black people, I see white people, I see Asian people, I see Hispanic people. That tells me one thing. You have not been conformed. You haven't gone to church because black people are there or white people are there. You've gone to church because Jesus is there. I can't stand it when I'm invited to a church. And all I see is the same people that look like everybody else. Because it makes me go, are we worshiping God or are we worshiping a style? Because there are some people that can't go to some churches because it's it's too loud in there. It's too loud. It's too loud. I don't like that church. It's too loud. They always shout. And and then there are some people who don't go because it's too quiet. I don't like that quiet stuff. It's too quiet, too monastic. But, you know, know, when it's the Holy Ghost, people from every nation begin to gather together because because a skin color isn't pulling you together jesus is pulling you together and there is no jew nor greek nor barbarian nor free because all are one in christ jesus and so we ought not to have black church or white church we ought to just have the church uniting to represent what the kingdom of heaven looks like So he ends this and summarizes this with this one final statement. He says, do not be conformed to the cosmos. Don't do what is cosmetically pleasing. Don't hang out with black people because you're black and white people because you're white. Because God is so, he's Jehovah Nisi, but he's also Jehovah Sneaky. And he's so, he is so Jehovah Sneaky that sometimes he will put your blessing in someone that doesn't look like you. I wish I could help get somebody to preach this because he 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 puts Ruth's blessing in Naomi and Naomi is kind of uppity folk but she Jewish here yeah, you see uh, Ruth is kind of Moabite she kind of gangster and ghetto you know the Moabites were ghetto and gangster and so Opa and Ruth are hanging out together and Opa says hey listen uh, 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 your blessing and my blessing are the same because we Moabites we need to stay away from that Naomi girl and if she says let's go let's go with her but let's just pretend and look like we're really sympathetic when she's going but Ruth goes listen you see ever since I started hanging out with you all the men I'm dating are broke just like you and I'm tired I don't know about this but I'm tired of getting the same men in the same community you're getting your men from you see I said this before I want Boaz not broke ass you know what I'm saying and I keep uh, I keep hanging out with the same person over and over again messing me up I need somebody like now your people are my people your God is my God where you die I die and there will be buried. Listen, he said, your music will be my music. If we're dancing to pop music, I'm going to dance to pop music. If you like reggae, goodbye world. I stand and I go with you. You see, sometimes it is religion and tradition that makes the word of God ineffective. And sometimes we get so conformed that we become uniformed. And instead of being prototypes, we become stereotypes. And people go, oh, you're one of them church people. You're stereotypical, happy, clapping Christian. But the Bible says the righteous are like the wind. That means they're unpredictable. You don't know where they came from. You don't know where they're going. looks at him and says hey sir do not be conformed because your form will get you to look for other people who look like you 
And your form will get you to hang in cliques that act like you. And your form will get you to think that because you're old, you should hang out with old people. Or because you're young, you should hang out with young people. Uh, I mean, sometimes, uh, uh, Mary, I know you want to hang out with people your age. But sometimes you just need to hang out with people who your baby kicks around. <laughs> sometimes you, you just got to get around people who your destiny comes alive when you come into their company. I ain't got time to hang out with somebody who doesn't make my baby kick. I don't have time to hang out with somebody who my destiny doesn't come alive in sitting down talking about EastEnders. I ain't got time for soap operas. I need to hang out with somebody who when I get into their company my destiny comes alive because I can see my assignment in them. So Mary, go, I'm going to Elizabeth's house because when I'm there, whew, that destiny I thought was dead comes alive. When You see, when Apostle and I start talking about media, we can talk for hours because it's like, boom, my baby just kicked. Did yours kick too? Whoa, it kicked. Oh, my God. Whoa, the contractions are coming. So he says, don't be conformed. I didn't make the form for you to get into the uniform. You see, I saw that I was speaking about the man who was sitting at a pool for 38 years, the crippled man. You see, and I forgot to mention what made him crippled the most was that the Bible says that a multitude of crippled people were with him. Sometimes you think just because you're disabled, you should go hang out with the disabled community. And you miss your breakthrough because you're trying to hang out with people who can't help you. The blind can't lead the blind. The deaf can't lead the deaf. You got to get around where you want to be, not where you are. Who knew that I would go to Nigerian churches for years and nothing would kick my destiny? I'd be going from black church to black church, Nigerian church to Nigerian church, African church to African church. And it was my own brothers that would hurt me the most. And yet... The one who God would call my spiritual father would be a woman who's four foot eleven, American and white, Caucasian, Californian lady, filled with the fire of God. But when I get around her, ha, my destiny begins to come alive. The prophetic mantle in me begins to call to the prophetic mantle in her. And all of a sudden, there's an, a nation's explosion because we got together because I broke the uniform. If you want to begin your prophetic destiny today, I can tell you how to do it. I can tell you. You want to know? Some people are so wondering how they're going to get in that they never get out. You see, you don't need to worry about how you're going to get in. God deals with how you get in. You need to worry about how you're going to get out. God says, Abraham, you want to be blessed? He says, yeah, 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 I do. Are you sure? He said, yeah, get out of your father's house. Get out. And then he says, get away from your kindred. Move away from your friends and your family. Why? Because some people can literally love you to death. Some people can love you so much and say, I know you. You started a business before and it didn't work. You did this before and it didn't work. You started a ministry before and it didn't work. I know you. You dropped out of school. Come on, son. Just stay at home with me. Just stay on saying, no, you got to get away from the incarceration of people's opinions because opinions can hold you back from your destiny. And sometimes you got to love your opera enough to say, I'll see you on the other side but I ain't got time for you right now you gotta break the uniform you gotta break the uniform and your parents will be upset that you broke it and your kids will be upset that you broke it and your aunties and your uncles will be upset that you broke it because everybody in your bloodline was a doctor your daddy's daddy was a doctor his daddy's daddy's daddy was a doctor and now you're telling me that you're gonna be a preacher I'm telling my story now and I decided I was gonna break the uniform if you want to be blessed, you got to break the uniform. Get out of the form of godliness. Stop living under Saul's armor. It's too heavy for you. It's not your assignment. This is too heavy. It's too heavy. Watch this. He says, where are we going? He said, I'll tell you when you get there. Now, why would God tell you to get out but not tell you when you're going until you get there? 
because God doesn't want you to take people with him. Because have you ever told, have you ever, have you ever told people somewhere you're going and they say, oh, we're going there too. And you're like, darn it. And they're like, yeah, we'll meet you at the airport as if they're doing you a favor. I'm like, what seat are you on the plane? You, you say 21B. Oh, we 21C. And you're like, mm. Sometimes God omits the details of where you're going because he doesn't want you to take the wrong people with it. And let me tell you something about the God we serve. God will deliver you from bad people and good people. You don't know about that God. You know about the God that will deliver you from good people. The God that will deliver you from lot, righteous lot, not wicked lot. The Bible says righteous lot because sometimes your lot is a lot. And sometimes God's like, I want to take you somewhere, but I can't take you with bad people and I can't take you with good people. I got to take you with the right people. And so when you're ready to let go of good people, you're ready for destiny. And so God says, don't be conformed. That's where I close. Don't be conformed. Because this last day move of God, God says, I'm going to part my spirit on all flesh. <laughs> and in case you thought it was a male patriarchal thing, I'm going to pour him out on women too. And in case you thought it was an age thing, I'm going to pour him out on your sons too. And in case you thought you were too old, I'm going to pour them out on old people too. And in case you thought this was a class thing, even the house help and the handmaid and the house servants and the house girl, everybody's going to prophesy. He says, don't be conformed to the world. In other words, don't let your form con you. Don't live to the standards of this person. We heard about the lady that's writing a book, a children's book. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. The earthen vessel is not the treasure. The CD is only as expensive as what's playing on it. You are only as expensive as the investment that God has put on the inside of you. And the greatest investment God put in us is his voice. Revelation is for your elevation. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our children. Thank you. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. I want to lay hands on you today. And I want to release an impartation. I believe that now we're in a time where the outpouring needs to accelerate. We've been on a 21-day prayer time. We've we asked people to join us for this time of fasting and prayer, and we went through 21 days from the 4th. We break today, tomorrow, depending on today. Okay. We break soon. And we've been on this 21-day prayer fasting time with the Lord. And uh, the Lord instructed us to do it, and he said, this month will be the month of revival. Amen. And we were praying. We were like, God, we want to be a part of this billion soul harvest. And God said, take a fast. So we took a fast. I called everyone, fourth of this month, we're all going on a fast. Only water and only juice for the next 21 days. That's why, that's why, thank you. That's why you're looking and I, I've lost half myself since I was last here. Because we've just been praying and pressing in. And, and we called it public. A thousand people registered to join us for this fast. And we began to pray from 12 to 1 for one hour. On night five, I was so tired, I said to Pastor Timothy, who works for me, I said, can you take it? I'm too tired. He took it from 12 to 1. My wife woke me up at 2.30 in the morning and said, babe, babe, I said, what's wrong? She said, they're still praying. I said, who's still praying? She said, the people who are fasting with us, they're still praying. I said, it's 2.30, they can't be praying. They got to, Tim's dismissing that one. She said, no, they're still praying. Thursday. They were still praying. Friday, they were still praying. 
Saturday, they were still praying. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Today, they're still praying. They haven't stopped. Some people, some of the, who's on the prayer? You're on the call? You're on the call? They haven't stopped. We didn't start it. We can't stop it. They've been praying, 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 praying. I mean the miracles. The miracles. Somebody was due to have their eyeball removed because it had got so septic that the doctor said, you'll never have this eye again. We've got to take it out. The day they came to the doctor, the doctor looked at the eye and wrote on the inscription, only God and the prayers of the saints could have done this. The eye totally healed. You can see it on my Instagram, before and after. Somebody came, swollen ankle. Had a word knowledge. There's somebody on here, you're watching, you have a swollen ankle. The next morning, they took a picture of both their feet. They showed me the before picture. The, the right leg was the size of a thigh. They took before and after. Straight, the same size. Somebody was due to have surgery, to have a cyst removed. The doctor looked at the x-ray and said, maybe I missed it, but the cyst is no longer there. I'm talking about miracles that you're seeing here. Listen, we are in revival. I hope you guys know this, this, I was in Nigeria in Lagos and I was sitting before the Lord in a pottery, uh, pottery room in the spirit. I was in this pottery room with the Lord and I saw a bowl, I saw a, pl- a saucer and I saw a big vase and the Lord said, Tommy, I'm pouring out my spirit. I said, amen. And he said, Which one of these should I pour it into? Now, this is important. It's very important. And I said to the Lord, Um, oh, you know, that bowl can hold a lot. And that vase, maybe, it can hold a lot, and then you can pour out what's being held. And the Lord said, No, son. Anything man holds is not revival. It's. Then I said, which one, God? And the Lord pointed at the saucepan, the saucer. He said, that's the one I want to use. I said, but God, it will spill over. And he said, exactly. What God is doing right now, no one can hold. No one ministry, no one church, no one place. God has flattened it because he intends on it running over. And we saw this spillover. So we just decided to stop everything we're doing. We haven't had church. We haven't had um, uh, uh, anything, uh, television, anything. We just decided to call it something unusual is happening. That's all we called it. Like, hey, guys, are you coming to something unusual is happening? That's what we call it, because it was unusual. We'd never seen anything like the saints just still praying, the revival breaking. I'm still getting emails, testimonies coming in. We've got so many testimonies, healings, miracles, stuff God is doing in people's lives. Things that I hear, heard here when I came in yesterday made me realize these are the early signs of the revival we're, we're beginning to experience. But I would be amiss if I don't say this before I sit down. Revival that just revives you is a waste of time. If all it does is wake you up, if all it does is it brings you back from sleep, but you don't do what you are here to do once you're revived, people will say the revival died. No, the revival did what it was supposed to do. So the Bible says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, all of those things. But then the ultimate thing is that they, then he says, and then you will rebuild the broken places. And then you, who's you? The you that's been healed, the you that's been bound up, the you that's had this freedom. He's expecting you to go from revival to reformation. There's a reformer's cry. And I'm telling you, I started stewarding this thing when I was 17, 18 years old, God gave me my first prophetic word 
And in this prophetic word, I saw riots happening in London. I was in a dream standing outside that station called Woolwich. I wasn't a London boy. I grew up in Essex. And I'm standing outside this station called Woolwich. And I saw this man murder this other man. And I just saw violence everywhere. And uh, it was right outside the station. I took a train to Woolwich Arsenal Station that next morning. I was so convicted. 18 years old. Mama said, where are you going? I said, Mom, I'm going to Woolwich. She goes, where's Woolwich? I said, I don't know. So I Googled it, and I saw Woolwich Station, and I, have, I went there. I took a train. Mom said, who are you going to meet? I said, I don't know. God, just, God is just impressing on my heart that I need to go to Woolwich. I got to Woolwich. I'm standing there. The moment my foot touched the ground, a woman called me. She said, are you Tommy? I said, yes. Who is this? She said, my name is Pastor Such and Such. Um, I saw you. I heard you on the radio last night. I said, listen, I don't know how this happened. I said, lady, I've never done radio in my life. The second time this happened, by the way, it's only happened twice. The second time this happened, a man came to me and said, thank you for preaching to me yesterday. I said, what? He showed up at the church. He said, you you, you came and you preached to me yesterday. I said, I've never preached to you. My brother was in another country at the time, so it couldn't have been him. I said, I never preached to you. He said, no, you did. He said, you told me that this was your church and that I should come here. So all I said was, well, you're welcome. <laughs> but remember when Peter's angel showed up and they believed it was Peter? Yeah. <laughs> it's a mystery, by the way. Anyway, let, let me finish this. So I showed up at Woolwich, and here I am in Woolwich, and this woman calls, I heard you on, I said, I've never done radio. I was arguing with her. She says, yes, you have a twin brother called Toby. I said, yes, you on radio? Yes, I said, I've never done radio. I said, well, she said, God told me to call you. I need you to come to my church. I said, where's your church? She said, Woolwich. Because the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. I said, hey, lady, I'm in Woolwich right now. She said, okay. She said, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. God told me to come here. I had a dream. She goes, wow. She called me to her office. I met her husband. That same day, she gave me an office. She said, this is your office. Do whatever you want here. If God's called you here because of something that's about to happen in this region, then he's put you here for a reason. So here I am with a brand new office. And one day, I called my mom and said, mama, I made it. <laughs> she said, what you mean? I said, mama, I have an office. I got it out. My, you know, I never had an office a day in my life. I said, mama, I got an office and everything. She said, great. I spent nights on that floor. I remember the next few days, that woman became very diabolical. And she started coming to me, you know, God told me that the conference you're doing, I should be the main speaker. Then next day she said, God told me the conference you're doing, we should charge people for deliverance. Can you believe it? I said, I laughed. I said, are you serious? I said, what, should we charge 50 pounds for Jezebel and 100 pounds for Belzebub? And she was like, no, 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 everybody's doing it. The whole church here is doing it. And the word the Lord gave me was, "If if the South London church doesn't repent, I will let the sword of Islam fall. So long story short, Um, this woman ended up kicking me out of the church um, after I exposed her. I called my mom, actually. You you met my mom. I said to to the pastor, the husband, I said, excuse me, your wife is a witch. I wasn't as couth. I wasn't as couth then. I wasn't as programmed. I said, your wife is a witch. He said, what? What do you say about my wife? I showed him text messages, pictures. She she gave me a phone that was just supposed to be between me and her. Don't tell my husband. Just for us. No, I showed her the phone. I brought out all the evidence. And the husband looks at the wife, did you do this? She said, I never did it. <laughs> and she starts these crocodile tears and she looks at me, it will not be well with you in Jesus' name. My mom stands up, it will be well with him in Jesus' name. <laughs> That's my mom. Return to sender. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Anyway, long story very short. Um, outside Woolwich Arsenal Station, a soldier got stabbed. And everybody wrote to me. That was the day God birthed the public prophetic ministry. Next thing that happened, I had a dream. And in this dream, I saw um, Obama. And this was when I was young. And Obama stormed into a restaurant I was sitting in. And when he stormed in, I looked at him. And he just poured himself a bowl of cereal. And he looked at me and said, I'm about to be the president of the United States of America. And he said, and I'm going to destroy America. And he said, and they're going to, I'm going to get away with it. Do you know why? Because I'm black. And I woke up from the dream and I said, whoa. My dad said, who's going to win? I said, Obama's going to win. My dad said, yay! One of us, black presidents. 
I said to my dad, it's not gonna be good, he's gonna destroy America. Had it not been for Obama, we would never have had gay marriage. Did you know that? He opened the gate for perversion because you wanted cosmetics over content. I know I'm not gonna get many amens, but it's okay. Years later, now this is what God did, and I'm saying this for a reason. Years later, I'm lying in my bed, and I have a dream. I'm in the exact same kitchen, but this time I get a knock on the door. I said, who is this? He said, it's Donald. I said, come in, same kitchen. He opens the door, and he says, can I pour you a bowl of cereal? I said, yes. He pours me a bowl of cereal. He says, can I sit down with you, sir? I said, yeah, sit down sits down and he says, he says, Tommy, can you do me a favor? I said, yes, sir. He said, can you thank the church for making me the 45th president of the United States of America? I said, yes, sir, I can. So I woke from the dream. I called a friend of mine at Revelation TV, Howard Conlon. He introduced me to Hugh Jackman, not the actor. And he said, hey, uh, uh, Tommy wants an interview with you. He's got a word that I think is crazy. I don't think he should do it, but he's going to do it, and uh, let's see what happens. So I gave this word. It's on YouTube. I, none of my words are ever pulled down. And um, I said, I have this vision, and Donald Trump will be the 45th president of America, and he'll give rights back to the church. He'll decide on abortion laws. He'll decide on all this stuff, and God's going to make him a righteous man and all of this. And the next day, I got canceled by near everybody. And um, all of a sudden, when the word came to pass, my inbox was littered. Littered. Some people saying, it only happened because you did some witchcraft. <laughs> Other people saying, dear God, I can't believe he's actually the president. What are we going to do? Has, it, has God said anything else? Nobody said anything encouraging. Everybody was like, we're doomed. So they were all asking me these questions. But one inbox I got, hello, my name is such and such, and I work for the United Nations. I'm one of the president of the select committee for this in the United Nations. Can you do me a favor? So I, she said, I watched your Trump prophecy. Can you come to the United Nations in Geneva and prophesy over our ambassadors? I said, yes. So I went to Geneva. Second time I went with my wife and kids. First time I went by myself, I was shaking. Here I am in Geneva. I'm in the ambassador's suite, and there are all these ambassadors and diplomats, and there's little old me. I managed to salvage a scrappy suit that I had somewhere, and I put it on, and I'm around these dignitaries. There's news crew there. There's ambassadors there, and I feel terrified. And this woman takes me back past security. She just holds a security badge up, and we walk like, like El Presidente. <laughs> I mean, it was serious. And we sit down, and she sits me in front of these two, this Indian couple, and she says, uh, hi, this is Prophet Tommy that I talked to you about. He's going to prophesy to you. I'll be right back. Hey! <laughs> the way I looked at her, I walk away, and I was like, come back. Come back. <laughs> I'm standing in front of this couple, and I look at them, and I have this vision. As I close my eyes, I'm like, please, God, speak. And I have this picture, and in this picture, I see this nuclear mushroom cloud standing behind him. I look at him and I said, excuse me, um, I see a picture of a nuclear mushroom cloud standing behind you. And I hear the Lord say, I've made you a diplomat between two very violently opposing sides. And you can decide right now whether a nation goes to peace or a nation goes to war. And they laughed and they looked at each other. They looked at me and they said, do you know who we are? I said, no. They said, We're the, we are the diplomats between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. So here I am in the United Nations. Next year, they invite us back. This Next year, they invite us back. They bring the ambassador of Yemen, Muslim countries. We're prophesying through letterboxes. <laughs> I see Muslims weeping in their hijabs as they're hearing the prophetic word of God spoken to them. Because everybody just wants to hear God speak. The ambassador of Yemen's wife said to me, Tommy, I believe Jesus is the son of God. She said, can you come with me to a mental home to go pray for my daughter? I said, yes, we're on a bus. 
because she didn't want anybody to know because it's a, it's a shame to have a child who's mentally ill. So you want anyone to know. So we took a private bus. Me and her excellence went on a bus and we went to a mental home and we prayed there for her daughter. And when we prayed, her daughter kissed me on the cheek and she wept and she said, he's never done that to anybody. She said, that's a sign to me that God will do it. Amen. I got back. I was watching um, X Factor. When I was watching X Factor, um, Simon Cowell picked these three guys to join a band called The Risk. I don't know if you ever saw that. And I saw this guy in The Risk, and the Lord said, he's not supposed to be there. I want you to prophesy to him. So I said, how? You know, because God says, go tell Pharaoh like you know Pharaoh. Yeah. I said, God, how? He said, go, go write to them. So I wrote to him on his fan page, and I said, excuse me, God just told me you're not supposed to be there, and he has a better plan for you, and he wanted to confirm it to you, and I left it. A couple of months later, I'm preaching at Ruach Church, Bishop John Francis, and everybody starts screaming. I'm looking, and the reason they're screaming is because this guy's just walked in. By the way, the next day, the newspapers read, blah, 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 leaves X Factor, Simon Cowell upset, for losing his winning act for religious reasons. He comes and he says, excuse me, um, I'm the guy that you prophesied over. I kept that prophetic word because I had a dream that I wasn't supposed to be there and I asked God to confirm it. And when you said it, I went to Simon and I left and he was upset. What's next for me? And I prophesied over him. I said, the Lord is going to open a door for you on media to stand as a voice for him in the BBC. A month later, he got accepted by Victoria Derbyshire to head her junior production team for the BBC. I gave a prophetic word later that year that to prepare Europe, to prepare England for an exodus from Europe, which later became known, we saw Brexit, Brexit, Brexit. This man remembered me from those years ago, and he called me, and he said, I need you to come on the BBC and prophesy the future of Great Britain. Why am I saying this? Because revelation is for elevation. The one with the eyes of the future will always have the greatest level of influence. When you possess it, God elevates you. Because you can pull something out of the dimension into the dimension. The president of Rig Africa is the queen of Wari. Her husband is the king of Wari. How did that happen? A year before I was on a plane, I met them. I prophesied over him. I said, I see a crown on your head that should be on your head, but it was taken. And God's going to give a king back his crown. That year, the old king died just suddenly. And then he became the new king. Have you not read that the Bible says kings, your, your kings will come to you? Why? Because revelation. I want to challenge you. Get back to hearing the voice of God. Because revelation is for elevation. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us. Proverbs 25 verse 2. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search out the matter. Oh, 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 oh,